Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here again today on our YouTube channel for episode number 891. Well, we are heading down to the border, 20 miles north of the United States-Mexico border in Patagonia, Arizona. We're going to be speaking with Brianna Young all about some very, very interesting supervised agricultural experiences. Really interesting what she's doing in sheep production and how she is involved in raising and caring for sheep and also what she's doing to work in a vet clinic to pursue a career as a veterinarian in the future. Really, really interesting stuff. We're going to get it started for you right now. Well, joining me today is Brianna Young, and she is coming to us from Patagonia Union High School in New Mexico, right, Brianna? In Arizona. Oh, Arizona. Oh, my goodness. Yep. I insulted you already. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. And uh, Brianna's getting ready to start, or you may have already started your senior year. Have you already begun? Yes, sir. Okay. Last so, week, actually. <laughs> okay. So she just started her senior year, and you're serving as your chapter's treasurer this year. Is that correct? Um. So this that was last year I served as our chapter um, treasurer. This uh-huh. year we have not had elections yet due to the whole COVID situation. Okay. So we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, welcome to the show. I'm very, very pleased to speak with you. Thank you. All right. Well, okay. So you're in Arizona. What town in Arizona is Patagonia Union High School in? It's in Patagonia. We're about 20 miles north of the Mexico-U.S. border. Is that right? Interesting. What's it like there? I mean, when when you say Arizona, I don't think people think of some of the mountainous and and really cool and snowy areas you have. Everybody thinks of Seguro Cactus and hot and dry. (laughs) What's it like in Patagonia? Um, It's very... Unlike Arizona, to be honest, we have tons of mountains, lots of cottonwood trees. Um, It's very small town, home feeling. Very cool. And have you grown up there your entire life? Yes, sir. Born and raised. Born and raised. All right. So uh, let's talk about your home life before we get into the FFA a little bit. So do you live on a farm or anything like that? Are you in town or maybe something in the the middle of those two? Um, Kind of in the middle of those two. So tell me about tell me about that. What's that look like? So um, pretty much we have like our own property where we keep our animals, our horses, um, our arena where we go and ride. And it's not considered technically a ranch, but we do own animals. <laughs> okay, got it. I got it. Okay, very good. And now have you been in, in the FFA now? Is this your fourth year or were you able to begin in middle school? Um, this is my fourth year. This is number four. Okay. So what brought you in? Why did you want to join the FFA? Um, agriculture is huge in my community. Everyone is a part of 4-H and FFA Mm -hmm. when I started was new to Patagonia. So it was really cool to see, um, our program really start up and grow. Okay. Very good. So it was just like, were you the, the charter member or they, have they been in existence for a couple years before you were able to join? There was actually two years before I joined. Two years before you are able to join. And that sounds like it's just kind of something that everybody does. Yep. Everyone (laughs) pretty much does FFA. If you're not an FFA, people kind of look at you funny. Like, what are you doing? Yep. (laughs) Okay. Very good. So you've been doing it for four years. And so... uh, You know, it's interesting. Some Some people join the FFA because they're like, I want to get out and spread my wings. I want to try something new. Other people, it's because... They already know that the agriculture is something they want to be involved in. And then you have communities like your own where, hey, everybody is involved in this. We're all doing this together. Um, Now, in your case, uh, where it's it's kind of a community thing, uh, you've you've kept with it for four years. So I'm assuming that it's gone well. Yeah, it's actually gone very well. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And how has how has the beginning of school been? Are you are you did you go back just like normal or are you guys having to do something because of coronavirus, something different? So, we are completely virtual. Um we have our classes the same time, but it's all through computer based. Okay. And we're not sure when we're going back. They're thinking about October now. Okay, so the thinking about October. So basically what you and I are doing right now is what you're doing during the day for school, is sitting in front of a Yes, computer. sir. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. So I'm talking to you during your school day. How did you get time away from school to be able to do this interview? 
um just let them know and they thought it was a really cool experience so okay. they said go for it <laughs> okay good very good yeah well, so I, you know, just out of pure self-interest here, my daughter, she is starting back to school on, you know, in a couple days from the time we're recording this interview. By the time this airs, she'll have been in school for a couple weeks, few weeks, but she's starting on Monday and they're going to do two days virtual, two days in, or three days virtual, two days in person. So how has that been? Are you watching your teacher teach like on Zoom and taking notes as if you were sitting in the classroom? Yeah, so we're pretty much doing a Zoom and like Google Classroom. So like our teacher will talk to us and then all of our assignments are on Google Class. We could go in and pretty much see what they're talking about as okay. they're explaining it. Okay. So I, I know you've just been doing it for a week, but are you finding it to be significantly different than in person? I mean, obviously the social aspect is different. I, I understand that. But in terms of the learning environment, does it make a difference if you're sitting in a desk in the class or if you're if you're watching the instructor on the screen? Um. Yeah, I feel like it does. The motivation has definitely gone down a little bit okay. uh, since we're in our home settings, but it's pretty much the same, honestly. Okay. So the motivation's gone down. So explain that to me. Um, pretty much like, so when I was at school, like really driven, wanting to get my work done. Um, now that I'm at home, I have a lot of distractions around me. Uh -huh. So it's just more hard to get focused. That's interesting. Now, what about internet connectivity? Has there been any issues in terms of the video freezing up and things like that, where you're kind of just sitting there waiting for it to get straightened out? Yeah, so we have, we're in the middle of our monsoon season in Arizona, so uh -huh. we have big thunderstorms coming in the afternoon, and it will knock out our internet for the rest of the day, so uh -huh. that's definitely been hard every day. <laughs> yeah, that will kill the motivation for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you, I, so what time, what time of day does school end for you? Uh, for me, it ends around 2, 2 10. Okay, so let's say a hypothetical that a monsoon comes through, the internet gets, you know, it gets zapped and it goes down at one o'clock. Now you've got another almost two hours of school left in the day. What do you do for the rest of the day? Do you just give up or do you sit there and wait and hope it comes back on? I mean, that's an interesting problem. Do you go on about your day or do you just kind of sit there hoping it comes back up so you can finish school? How does that work? Um, so pretty much like what I do is I connect up on my phone since I have a okay. uh, wireless. Okay. Yeah. And then I could just go right back into class. I uh, got it. Okay. So when that happens, it's not, so the internet's not getting knocked out at the school where the teacher is providing the instruction, uh, just at your place. Cause you live out of town a ways. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Got it. Now these interesting problems that we're going to face this year and see how this works. It's very, very interesting. All yes. right. Well, how, how many FFA advisors do you have there at Patagonia? I have one. It's a very small program. Okay. Who is that? Let's acknowledge that person. Uh, Tanya St. John. Okay. Well, very, well, thank you for doing that. I always like to, to acknowledge our FFA advisors. And, Brianna, I'm going to take just a moment uh, to acknowledge a couple of our sponsors for the show. And everybody, of course, I want to make sure and mention Lacrosse Footwear. You can find them at lacrossefootwear.com. Love talking about lacrosse when... We do our FFA interviews because they are so proud to support the FFA by annually sponsoring $25,000 in scholarships and jackets as part of the Give the Gift of Blue program. And of course, we use their Alpha Range boots right here on our farm every single day of the year, whether it's winter and I'm out feeding in the snow and the mud and the ice, or it's summer and I am out irrigating. I've always got my lacrosse Alpha Range boots on. We want you to do the same as well. And then, of course, Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. Yeah, we have a Powder River Squeeze Chute, Powder River Cattle Panels right here on our farm for our cattle uh, developed out here in the West with range cattle, some of the hardest to handle cattle we have in the United States for over 80 years now. And they have developed products that can handle and minimize stress on these wild cattle. And if they can do that for those cows, well, they can certainly do them for years. So let your local farm and ranch retailer know You'd like to see that Powder River Green out there in their sales yard, and you can check out their full line of products to help you out on your farm with your cattle at powderriver.com. All right. Well, Brianna, let's get back to you. <laughs> so let's talk about what you've been doing for your supervised agricultural experience. I know you've got a few different SAEs. Tell us about those. 
Um, yeah, so I do sheet production. Um, I work for a guy up in Phoenix, which is about three hours away, mm-hmm. and I keep sheep dead at my place. Uh, okay. I have about 30 right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so let's park on that for a second. So the sheep that you have on your place in Patag- Patagonia, they belong to a person from Phoenix? Yes, sir. Kevin Bloomquist. Okay. So explain to me this relationship, this business relationship. How does this work? So pretty much um, I get, he brings sheep down in like June when it gets too hot in Phoenix for Mm -hmm. them pretty much to live. And I feed them, care for them, give them shots um, over the summer until we go and sell them. That is a really cool way to do things. So how did you develop this? How did you get this going? Um, well, I've known Kevin for a long time and he offered me it and I thought it was a really cool experience to try out and I've been doing it for three summers now. That's great. Good for you. Now, are you, are you taking care of the sheep there on your, your family's property or does he have property down there that you're taking care of the sheep on? Um, so both. So half of them are on my property, the 30, and then there's about another 45 on his property right next to mine. Very interesting. That's cool. So do you get paid like like an hourly wage or something, or do you get a share of the sheep? How does this work for you? Um, Pretty much it's like a stipend. So at the end, we just agree, and that's how I get paid. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Now, this is something I've thought about many, many times, and that is, um, like in, in his case, it sounds like he's got property and land that he keeps sheep on up in Phoenix. Is that correct? Yep. But, uh, of course, it gets just very, very hot there in the middle of summer. And so he's got to move them to somewhere else. And that would create, obviously, a logistical problem for him if he could not find somebody like you to take care of the sheep in the other location. And that's something I've thought about before. I've thought about uh, that on my own place uh, as I get busier with my business, with the podcast, things like that. Finding somebody who I could partner up with and we could come up with some sort of a deal and they could help me irrigate, take care of cattle and things like that. And uh, so you, I will tell you right now, you probably already know this, but you are a huge blessing uh, to Mr. Bloomquist because uh, you're solving a lot of logistical problems for him right now. Oh, <laughs> thanks. That is great. Now, had you worked with sheep prior to this beginning? I have. So we go up to um, Mr. Bloomquist's house during the winter, okay. and we pretty much lamb all of his sheep out. Okay. I've been doing that since I was in middle school, and I also show sheep all throughout the state of Arizona. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, I am I am detecting there's some family history in the sheep business here. Um, Not really. <laughs> so my grandpa and grandma, they ran cattle all through Patagonia, okay. and never really got into the sheep business. Okay. Now, when you said that we go up to Phoenix, you lamb out all of his his sheep. So who is we? Is that you and your parents? My sister, actually. You and your sister. Okay. So yeah. who, who taught you about lambs? Who taught you about sheep? They're a little bit different than cattle. Um, Mr. Bloomquist actually taught me most of my knowledge about them. Very interesting. Wow. So this is a really symbiotic relationship i mean he is depending on you but you're you've learned a ton of skills uh from being able to help him out yeah that is great now you've been able to develop this into a showing career where are you showing like at jackpot shows and things like that yep so we have a organization throughout arizona it's called sayla and i show through that that is great and how's that been going for you um, it's been good. A little bit rocky since COVID started, sure. but it's good. Okay. So you've, <laughs> you've seen some success in the show ring? Yes. Good. Good for you. Very yeah. cool. Well, that that's wonderful. I, I love that arrangement. When I was your age, I would have I would have paid somebody just to let me go work with their livestock. I was so hungry to do that and, and wanted to get started. So that is wonderful that you get to do that. Now, I, I saw on the questionnaire you filled out prior to the interview that you also listed uh, veterinary science and equine science as SAE. So do you have a total of three? I do, actually. I work at a veterinary clinic um, in Green Valley, which is about an hour away from my place. Okay. And then um, I also do an internship with the Vera Earl Ranch with their AQHA reining studs. Okay. Interesting. Now, 
let's talk about the internship with the horses uh, to begin with. So what does that look like? What is your what are your duties there? Uh, so pretty much I muck pens, and then once I'm done with that, I get a schedule of what horses need to be worked and saddled, washed off, and then we go from there, start doing that. Very cool. And now what led you to this internship? Why did you want to do that? Um, I love working with horses. I've been doing it since I was five. Uh, I really have an in with more like showing and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So these working with these cow horses was an amazing opportunity for me. And do you ever get to work cattle on them? Yep. That we is go great. and sort. Yeah. So that's interesting. Now I've ridden some good cow horses, um, and they weren't cutting horses per se, but they were good at, they'd get a, you know, they could tell which cow, which calf I was after and they would cut them out. Do the horses you're working with, they kind of have the same instinct? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I work with, a stud who actually made it to Nash or sorry, not nationals world. Oh, wow. Um, in the cutting, he's okay. very automatic. He's a super awesome horse to ride. Very cool. So these are actually cutting horses then. Yeah. Oh, that is half great. for cutting half for cow horses. It's okay. just kind of a mixture. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I've been on some good horses. Like I said, I've never been on a pure cutting horse. I don't know that I could stay on a pure cutting horse. They would, they'd go left I'd still be going right, and they would all be over. They'd have the cow pinned up, and I'd just be sitting on the ground. <laughs> oh. All right. Now, you obviously have another interest if you are driving an hour one way to work in a vet clinic. So how did that come about? Um. So my mom manages it, and we're really good friends with the doctor there. So she let, or lets me come in for... Mm -hmm let's see, three summers now and pretty much get like really good experience working in that field. Okay. So we know where the connection comes from, but where does the commitment come from? Why do you want to drive an hour one way to work in a vet clinic? What's, what's this look like for you? What, what, I guess, what compels you to do this? Um, this is what I kind of want to do for my future. I'm really mm -hmm. interested in to go into veterinary sciences. I suspected. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you've been doing this now for three summers? Yep. And so have you, you know, with your interest in becoming a veterinarian, have you been able to sit in on surgeries? Have you been able to, to do some things on your own and, and learn how to do some of these, I, I don't know, maybe minor surgeries or the application of medicine, things like that? Um. So definitely, I've been um, able to watch some really cool surgeries. Um, mostly we work with the people who just like come in for checkups and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then I get to draw up like rabies vaccine, Bordetella and all that sort of thing. Okay. And so are you working primarily with small animals at this clinic or do you get to do any work with large animals too? Yeah, we're primarily small animals. Gotcha. Now, as you're looking forward to your future, are you thinking that you would like to be a, a small animal vet? Yeah, I love large animal, um, but I really enjoy the small animal aspect of it also. Okay. What what is it about that that stands out for you? Um, honestly, the just um need for it. People need small animal vets mm -hmm. more than large animal. So, gotcha. yeah. So you're seeing opportunities there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Now, is there been is there been like one experience working at the vet clinic that stood out to you? Um, yeah. So I was actually able last summer to watch a surgery where uh, a pit bull came in and he ate a shoe <laughs> and we had to extract that from him. And it was awesome. It was literally the coolest thing I've ever watched. Really? Now, I'm yeah. assuming the shoe was in multiple pieces, but am I right about that? Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. So the shoe is in his stomach in multiple pieces. So the extraction... Is that something where it's a full-blown surgery, they have to open up the stomach, or, or how did that get done? Yeah, so we were hoping when he first came in to us that maybe he could pass it since it was in or different pieces, uh -huh. but he just wasn't able to. He was in a lot of pain, so they had to take him into surgery and open up his stomach and take it out. Wow. Yeah, those dogs, we love them, but they can, uh, <laughs> they can create a lot of chaos pretty quick, can't they? For sure, yes. 
<laughs> All right. So here you are. Uh, you are just you're beginning your senior year. Uh, you said your elections are coming up. Are you uh, wanting to stay on the officer team for your senior year? Yeah, I'm actually running for our chapter president. Oh, well, good luck to you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Uh, uh, so that's great. And hopefully this interview can help you along those along those lines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so with that, uh, you've got you've got your senior year and your goal is to be president. If you do become your chapter's president, are there are there things you want to accomplish this year for your chapter? Um, I do. I really want to key in on our competitions. I feel like in the past, We've kind of gone out. We've had a couple um, teams that have made it to nationals, but mm -hmm. I really would like to get our chapter out there more. Oh, that'd be cool. And then what about when you're done? Hey, this is your last year of high school. What's next? Um, I'm going to college and not really sure where yet, either looking at New Mexico State or University of Arizona. Oh, okay. So University of Arizona or New Mexico State now – this is going to sound dorky, but right now your mascot is the Lobos. Is New Mexico State the Lobos too? They're the Aggies. Oh, so that's the University of New Mexico yeah. that's the Lobos. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Aggies are going to hate me. for. I'm having a horrible time here. <laughs> I am bookending our interview, the start and the finish, with uh, sticking my foot in my mouth. Uh, oh, man. Well, if I swallow my shoe, at least I know you know how to get it out. But anyway, see, yeah. <laughs> horrible humor on the Off Farm Income oh. Podcast. So you'll be staying in the desert southwest for college. Uh, at least at this point, that's what you're thinking at the University of Arizona or at New Mexico State. And then do either of those two colleges have a vet school or would you be transferring to a different college for veterinary school uh, once uh, you are accepted? Um, so University of Arizona actually just started their vet school mm -hmm. last year. Okay. If I do go to New Mexico State, um, Colorado University or Colorado State University is a really um big option for me okay. after I graduate. So yeah. <laughs> that is great. Well, every time this comes up, I I always throw myself under the bus. I started off pre vet. And it took me maybe a semester, maybe half a semester to figure out that I wasn't smart enough. Uh, to do that. So I really admire you for for going after that because uh, that is a rigorous course of academic work. And I'm sure you're going to do great. I personally could not handle the chemistry, the genetics, none of it. It, it, it just was not uh, something. There was just not enough up here for me to get that done. But I have a feeling it's going to be a different story with you. That is great, Brianna. This has been a pleasure to uh, to get to know you. Before we wrap it up, I'd love to ask you, obviously you want to stay in or around agricultural in one respect or another what is it about the agricultural lifestyle that you like um honestly everything about it i just love agriculture i can't see myself anywhere else everything i just love it yeah well that's great well thank you so much for sharing a little bit of it with us today thank you for having me well, thank you for being here, everybody, and thank you to Brianna Young for coming on the Off Farm Income Podcast today. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.